Right, in this video, we're going to continue our unit one review about um, our intro to functions. So in this question, we'd like to identify some key features and context based on this graph. So here we have the graph of a ball being launched into the air, and we want to find, uh, use the graph to find the following. We want to figure out the initial height of the ball. So where did the ball start height-wise? And if I am launching a ball into the air, it's going to start right over here at the left side of my graph. So that is 80 feet. So the initial height of my ball is 50 feet high. The next question says, what's the maximum height of the ball? So I want to find out the highest it ever went. And the highest it ever went is 144 feet. So that's our maximum height right there. Up next, axis of symmetry. This is a key feature. This doesn't have anything to do with the story. The key feature is just asking me where could I fold this graph so that it's symmetrical. And even though I don't have the entire image, it does look like a, an upside down parabola because it is. And my parabola has an axis of symmetry right through the vertex where I could fold it in half and it looks the same on the left and the right. So that axis of symmetry happens at this x value, x equals 2. Up next, the question's asking how long it took the ball to reach its maximum height. Well, if 144 is my maximum height, it would take me this long to reach that height. So instead of just the number two, now I can put the two back in the story. The time it took the ball to reach its maximum height was two seconds. And the last question here is the time it took the ball to hit the ground. So the ball hits the ground right over here at five seconds. There we go. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at question five. Question five has moved on to the topic of composition, which is plugging one fu function into another. And it says in the directions, remember, f of g of x with f and g side by side means the same thing as f o g of x. The one on the left is Cambridge notation, which we've been using in class. The one on the right is American notation, and there might be American notation on the test. So please make sure you understand that those mean the exact same thing. And it just means that x has been plugged into g, and that in turn has been plugged into f. So again, over here, x gets plugged into g, and then whatever you get gets plugged into f. So it just moves everything to whatever's on the left, right to left. So my very first uh, equation over here says f of g of 2. So my job is to take the number 2 and plug it into g, g, which is right here. So I'm going to go ahead and find g of 2 to start. There we go. So I have to do negative 3 times 2 minus 4, plug in the number 2 there. That gives me negative 6 minus 4, which gives me negative 10. Now that I've found g of 2, my job is to take that number and plug it into f. So I'm going to take this number here and find f of negative 10. So 2 times negative 10 plus 5. We'll go ahead and use the negative 10 as the number we plug in there. So 2 times negative 10 is negative 20 plus 5. We end up with negative 15. And that would be our final answer for that question. Up next, I want to find g of h of 2. Again, that means I have to start with this inside number 2, and I'm going to plug it in, working my way to the left. So I'm going to take 2 and plug it into h, which is that function right there. So let's go ahead and find h of 2. I have to do 2 squared plus 3 times 2 minus 12. So let's go ahead and plug in that 2 everywhere we saw x. So h of 2, 2 squared, 3 times 2 minus 12, and we'll go ahead and simplify this using the order of operations. 2 squared is 4, 3 times 2 is 6, minus 12, that ends up as 10 minus 12, which is negative 2. That tells me h of 2, now I have to go ahead and take that and plug it into g, so g of that negative 2. And I'm going to have to plug that into the g function, which does negative 3 times what I plug in, minus 4. So I'm going to plug in that negative 2, here from the last answer. Negative 3 times negative 2 is positive 6 minus 4, which makes my answer 2. So I took my 2 and plugged it into h. I took that answer, plugged it into g, and I have my final solution. 
Now my very last job here is to find f of h of x, and this time I do not know what x is, so x is going to stay the letter x, and my job is just to take the function h of x and plug it into f. So I'm going to start with my function h of x, which is x squared plus 3x minus 12. And I have to take this entire function and plug it in to the function f of x. f of x takes what I plug in here, and it multiplies it by 2, and it adds 5. So we need to take this function and multiply it by 2 and add 5. Once I'm done with that, this problem will be finished. So let's go ahead and multiply this by 2. I'm going to distribute the 2 to everything inside my parentheses. So 2 times x squared, I just have two things called x squared. 2 times 3x is 6x, and 2 times negative 12 is negative 24. Then I can add the 5 from the very end. So that just combines those last terms. So my final answer is 2x squared plus 6x minus 19. And that one's all finished. Again, when I don't have an x value to plug in, it just means my final answer is going to be an equation. All right, let's go ahead and take a peek at question 6. Question six is asking about rates of change. So let's go ahead and take a look at the rate of change for this graph. To find rate of change, I'm trying to find the slope, which is rise over run, and my formula is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Those f values are my y values, that's my outputs, up and down, so that's my rise, and the a and b are my inputs, the x values, so that's side to side. Now they gave me my interval right here from 4 to 6. So here's 4 on my graph to 6 on my graph. So that's my a and b value. 4 is a, 6 is b. So that means I can automatically fill in my denominator, 6 minus 4. Now to fill in my numerator, I need f of 4, and I need f of 6. Now to find f of 6, here's my x value 6, I need to figure out where that hits my y-axis, and it hits it right there at the number 16. So f of 6 is the number 16. Let's do the same thing with f of 4. So for f of 4, I'm going to go over to the 4 on my graph here, and I want to figure out where that hits my y-axis. And it's going to happen between 12 and 16, which is the number 14. So 16 minus 14. So to finish up this problem, all I have to do is simplify these numbers. Subtract my y values, I get the number 2. Subtract my x values, I get the number 2, and my final answer is 2 divided by 2, which is 1. So the rate of change between 4 and 6 is 1. It looks like it's going up 1 and over 1. Let's go ahead and try the same thing for the rate of change on the interval 0 to 11. So uh, from 0 to 11, so this time the a value they gave me is 0, the b value is 11. So on the graph over here, this time I am going, oops, it's not an eraser, here we go. This time I'm going between 0 and 11. So here's 0 right over here, and 11 is right there. So let's see what happens for my rate of change now. So I have my a and b values, I can go ahead and plug those in. b is 11, a is 0, there's my denominator. Now to find f of 11, I'm going to look at my graph at 11 figure out where that touches my y-axis, and it touches right up here at 40. Then we'll figure out what f of 0 is, and at 0, I'm at 0 on my y-axis, so 40 minus 0. Now when I simplify this guy, it's not very pretty, but it's just 40 over 11. I don't have to turn that into a decimal. I do have to reduce it fully. There's no context here, so decimals aren't necessary, but do have to make sure it's reduced. But 11 is a prime number, and it doesn't have anything in common with 40, so that is actually reduced as well. So that would be my final answer for part B, 40 over 11. For the final part, it's asking, oh, there's two more questions. Which rate of change is higher, so the first interval from 4 to 6, or the second interval from 0 to 11? 40 over 11 is larger than 1. 11 over 11 is 1. This is almost 4 times bigger. So which one's higher? That's going to be the interval from 0 to 11. 40 over 11 is much bigger than the number 1. So that interval is higher. The last question is phrased in a way that might seem a little confusing, but it's actually a very straightforward question. It says, what is the vertical change? What is the rise between x equals 9 and x equals 11? 
So to find our rate of change, we do rise over run. This is literally just asking for the rise. So what is the change in y values? That's it. That's all I have to do. So my x interval is um, from 9 to 11. So for this problem, we're just going from 9 to 11. And all I want to know is the rise. So all I have to do is f of 11, which is the number 40. So that's going to be f of 11 minus f of 9. So it's going to be 40 minus whatever f of 9 is. So on the graph here, if I go to 9, go up to my graph, where does that hit? It hits at 24. So 40 minus 24. Literally just, oops, literally just asking how high is my change. So 40 minus 24 gives me the number 16. My rise is 16 units. That's it. So we're going to pick up with the next question in the next video.